Well, uh, thank you, Paul, for uh, coming here today. I really appreciate it. Here's the uh, copy of my book, uh, put out by Clarity Press, just came out. And uh, I'm noticing uh, in terms of uh, looking at other books and uh, okay, conferences uh, that this question of democracy and uh, global capitalism is really becoming uh, more widely addressed and with greater and greater concern. And for good reason, uh, obviously. I think the uh, UK exit from the uh, EU uh, is one indication of the crisis uh, that's ongoing. And uh, I would like to maybe address that towards the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, the book covers a lot of territory, so I won't cover it all today. Uh, but essentially, in terms of a quick outline of the book, I try to start off with a uh, discussion of the relationship between the market, uh, government, or the state, and civil society. Uh, I criticize both capitalism, 20th century socialism, and anarchism for failing to resolve uh, the relationships of, between these three fundamental institutions. Um, and then I spend a number of chapters discussing global capitalism and the emergence of the transnational capitalist class. Um, I move on to talk about green capitalism uh, as a pop possible alternative, and I'll include that in the discussion of today. Um, what I won't really cover is the chapters on the Ukraine, where I go into the uh, sort of contradictory uh, phenomena between nationalism and transnationalism. Uh, global capitalism, as it's developed in China, is a large chapter. Uh, an analysis of the Bukharan and the new economic policy of the early Soviet history and anarchism and how it, uh, in the Occupy movement and uh, Paracon of Michael Albert from a critical standpoint. And the last chapter deals with alternatives and there I try to discuss what I think is some of the most interesting thinking on protagonistic democracy, Marta. Harnaker from South America, Linera Garcia, who is the Vice President in Brazil, David Schweiker, our friend uh, from uh, Loyola University here in Chicago, uh, and uh, some other thinkers about uh, cooperatives and democracy, and uh, try to suggest a uh, sort of a post-capitalist democratic society for the 21st century. And if you want, we can certainly uh, discuss uh, that in the uh, question and answer period more. But in terms of the presentation, I'd like to cover the first uh, sections of the book on uh, the historical development of democracy, on what global capitalism means for democracy. Uh, I'd like to discuss a bit on green capitalism and uh, possible other alternatives, such as reactionary nationalism like Trump is suggesting, uh, and perhaps ended up with maybe a short discussion of the UK exit and what that means in terms of global capitalism and what we're looking at. And I hope to do that in about 40 minutes to try to keep time on myself here on the clock so we'll have plenty of time for some debate and discussions and uh, questions. So let me, uh, let me start. So I want to start with the bourgeois democratic revolution and what I call the uh, dialectical democracy. I think one of the problems of left analysis has been to see uh, democracy as somehow separate from the development of capitalism uh, rather than inherently part of its historic development and that everything uh, sort of progressive that we've won in terms of democratic rights and uh, social contract and labor rights and women's rights and civil rights have been sort of um, outside of capitalism, sort of on the maybe the socialist end or the progressive end of history rather than the capitalist end of history. I rather look at it from a more dialectical relationship that democracy 
and property rights both are both aspects of capitalism. They've been in conflict from the very beginning, but that this is a unity of opposites. They both exist in tension and in contradiction with each other, uh, and they arise out of historical materialism. Uh, so that, uh, let's go back briefly to the French and the uh, American Revolution, where really modern political democracy, I think, begins. And what created those revolutions was a class alliance between uh, the rising capitalist class, as well as farmers and peasants and craftsmen and laborers to overthrow the aristocracy in France or colon British colonialism here in the United States. And so, as part of that political intellectual revolution, we have such wonderful documents as Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, where he states that all men are created equal. We have the uh, Declaration of the Rights of Man and the French Revolution, liberty, fraternity, solidarity, uh, fundamental concepts of revolutionary democracy that brought about citizenship, nationalism, democracy, civil society, voting rights, all came out of this, these original concepts. Now, those original concepts, as written by Jefferson and written by the new revolutionary French parliament when these ideas first came out, were really limited to white men who own property. But that's not how the masses of people looked at these ideas. When liberty, fraternity, solidarity got onto the streets in Paris, the Parisian masses took that to heart. It was their revolution. It was they were going to be part of this new society. Uh, I think when farmers and laborers here in the United States heard of all men are created equal, they didn't think, oh yeah, that's good for my boss, that's good for the landowners. They thought, this is good for me too. This is my revolution. That's why they joined the Continental Army. So right from the beginning of the bourgeois revolution was this tension created through this class alliance. Uh, and the class alliance was necessary to overthrow the old regimes. Uh, so democracy was a class compromise right from the very inception of these new societies. And the compromise was necessary because of the alliance, of the revolutionary alliance. It wasn't, it, you know, so I think that's really the origins of how to look at the question of democracy. That it's a dialectical relationship uh, that's always been part of modern society. Now, for the capitalists, democracy meant property rights, that I am free to own property, to do with that property what I will, and to make money in the market. And the aristocracy cannot limit me or stop me from that ownership and those rights, right? Uh, for people like you and me, uh, democracy meant civil society, meant political rights, and meant voting rights, meant uh, citizenship, fundamentally. So that tension was there from the very beginning, right? These two conceptions of democracy that were linked together historically, not separate, but linked in a dialectical relationship of contradiction and tension. Now, if we look at sort of the development of democracy over the last 200 years and how it's extended to women's rights and civil rights and labor rights and voting rights. Uh, many of these, the extension of democracy came out of uh, crisis. So when there were major crises within capitalism, they t tended to extend democracy. The other part of the crisis is, I guess, Naomi Klein's thesis that crisis capitalism creates uh, disaster capitalism. But I think that's only half of the picture. And if you only look at that half of the picture, you really have a misunderstanding of how capitalism has developed. So 
if you think about not only the Revolutionary Wars, but let's now go to the Civil War of 1860, 1865. Again, this was a basically a war be, within the ruling class, like the revolution was between the bourgeoisie and the aristocracy. This war was between the rising industrial capitalists and the slaveocracy in the South. And who did the industrial capitalists in the North have to rely on to win that war? The working class and emancipated slaves. So again, you have this class alliance. And out of the Civil War, you have Reconstruction, the end of slavery, the extension of voting rights, the start of public schools, and all other sorts of other uh, democratic extensions. Now, of course, every time you extend democracy, the capitalists try to push back. So you have the end of Reconstruction and the rise of Jim Crow. That's part of the dialectic, the historical dialectic that goes back and forth. Let's go on to the Great Depression and World War II, again, crisis capitalism. But out of the Great Depression, you have a struggle between Keynesian capitalism and fundamental free market capitalism, right? And who does Roosevelt and the Keynesians have to rely on in that battle? They have to rely on the working class again to save capitalism, essentially, right? By extending labor rights, by extending social security, by creating minimum wage laws and child care laws, et cetera, et cetera. All that comes out of the Great Depression and the renewal of the alliance. That alliance is extended in World War II. Again, World War II is a violent struggle between two sides of capitalism, bourgeois democracy and fascism, both capitalists but with a very different concept of how capitalism should be organized and run. And who do the bourgeois Democrats have to rely on to win the war against fascism? They have to turn to us again to win that war, the working class and middle class. And out of that victory, again, you get the extension of the social contract, uh, health care system, uh, higher wages, home ownership, all sorts of things come out of that, that war and that alliance. So, I think what we're talking about here, therefore, is what was best understood by Gramsci, the Italian Marxist, uh, and his dialectic between the capitalism that is basically one of consent and coercion, right, because that's what we see here. Throughout, throughout the historical development. So whenever capitalism incorporates popular demands, it entails consent by both the capitalists and the social movements. Both are consenting to capitalism, right? The capitalists consent to bring popular demands and enshrine them institutionally in law and government, voting rights, civil rights, women's rights, and those social movements consent to be taken into capitalism and to be institutionally, um, institutionally enshrined within the capitalist system, right? It's not a revolution, it's a reform, right? So there's consent on both sides. So it's not just that the capitalist, uh, part of the capitalist class always hates any of these reforms and always push back. But other sections of the capitalist class internalize these reforms also, right? That's how we end up with social democracy. Uh, so how does this, how does globalization impact this last 240 years of development of, of democracy and capitalism? Well, I think the socialist movement always wanted to escape this dialectic, right? We've always wanted to end this relationship with the capitalist class because democracy was never complete, never full, still full of oppression, violence, racism, sexism. We see it today when we look at the headlines every day. So capitalism can never fully become democratic because 
of the property rights and the materialism and the market-based ideology of the capitalist class. So we as the socialist left or the progressive left have said, well, the way to resolve this historic dialectic is to eliminate the capitalist class, right? That's the way we resolve it, working class power. Uh, what I thought, I think we didn't quite understand fully, the capitalist class also wanted to get out of this dialectic. They also wanted to end this relationship with their national working class. They were also wanted to end these compromises and this class alliance. And that's what globalization allows them to do. That's exactly where neoliberalism and globalization come to bear. Because globalization allows nationally rooted capitalist class to become a globally rooted capitalist class and farewell to their working class. Because now they have a global working class and 1.5 billion new workers in China and India and Russia and Eastern Europe. Uh, and so what we see with the rise of globalization is the rise of a transnational capitalist class. And I think this is a historic development uh, which we really need to get our minds around. Because both the left and the right and the center all are still sort of think of the world through nation-centric uh, thinking and lens. That economies are basically bounded by national borders, that corporations have some type of national identity, that governments somehow protect and extend their own national champion, corporate champions, and somehow have some sort of social contract with their working class. Well, all that has changed and is undergoing further change. Because if you look at corporations today, what you see, and production today, you see it thoroughly globalized at every stage and every level of development. There are no national corporations left. If you look at every large transnational corporation and who invests in those corporations, who are the stock owners of those corporations, you will find it is all those corporations are owned by capitalists from all around the world. And I don't care what corporation you want to talk about, whether it's IBM and Google and GM or whether it's Monsanto, or whether it's Siemens, or whether it's Barclays, or Deutsche Bank, or Chinese giant corporations, all of them are transnationally integrated through uh, financial investments. Uh, and I think not only is production global, and I think a lot of people have understood this for a long time, I mean, uh, that global assembly lines extend throughout the world. But I think even more importantly, at the center of transnational capitalism and global capitalism is finance capital. And so let me talk about finance capital for a little bit, because I think what finance capital is and how it functions is that, and I'm not, it's just not banks, right? It's hedge funds and all sorts of other things, right? So when you look at like BlackRock, which is the largest financial institution in the world, uh, which has something like $5 trillion under management. How many of you, by the way, just are interested, how many of you have heard of BlackRock? That's great, that's good, because five years ago, I would have seen about one hand, you know. So it shows that people are everywhere, we're becoming knowledgeable about this stuff. Now, BlackRock, whether it's BlackRock or Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan or Deutsche Bank or Barclays or the, uh, the big Chinese banks, they're taking in trillions of dollars worldwide, right? Capitalists from all over the world, whether it's Nigeria or Argentina or Russia or Great Britain or America or China or Singapore, everybody is pouring money into these large financial institutions which offer hundreds and hundreds of different financial um, products for them to invest in. 
right? All sorts of different ways to invest your money in all sorts of corporations all around the world. And those trillions of dollars come into these financial institutions and that money is organized by these financial institutions into investments that then go out into the world, uh, into corporations all over the world. Now BlackRock is headquartered in New York. It doesn't mean that it just invests in America. That's totally ridiculous. BlackRock invests everywhere in the world, right? Uh, Barclays is in London. Does Barclays just invest in the UK? That's ridiculous. Barclays invests all over the world. The Chinese banks, do they just invest in China? That's ridiculous. They invest all over the world. And the data is absolutely clear on it. The data is absolutely clear if you do the reading and it's in the book. So that money goes out into the world uh, making investments in corporations and other banks and other financial institutions around the world. It makes profits off the labor of men and women all over the world. Those profits are re-centralized in those financial institutions and go out as profits to their main investors. That's what the heart of global capitalism is today. And it's totally global. So you can't think of GMO, oh, that's an American corporation. No, GM is a world corporation with sales and assets and employment that are greater outside the United States than inside the United States, right? Let's take an un-American, non-American uh, example, Siemens, GE, GE's great competitor. Siemens, a worldwide corporation, is German. Now, Siemens is one of the 100 largest employers in the United States. It's in every state of the union. Pays good wages and exports about $4 billion out of the United States to world markets every year. Now, is Siemens, as a German corporation, somehow trying to undermine the American economy and outcompete the American economy? Or are they part of the American economy itself as a German corporation? And isn't GE, in fact, in Germany with major research facilities and also manufacturing facilities in Germany? And is GE trying to undermine the German economy and exploit it? Or is it part of the German economy and, in fact, the strength of the German economy and the strength of the American economy and the strength of the Chinese economy is important for all of these transnational corporations. No one's trying to conquer anybody. They're investing in everybody and they want a stable economic world where they can make money without problems, without borders, and without a bunch of social movements demanding various uh, uh, rights and democracy from them. Well, that, that's what the world is today. And the governments are, have rewritten regulation and rewritten taxes and rewritten the rules of trade to facilitate a transnational uh, structure, political and economic structure for these transnational corporations. It's not that governments are weaker is that the capitalist class has reconfigured government to serve their new formations and their new social relationships. That's, what, that's, that's what's happened. Um, so, this transnational class, through its organization, which is global, is by its nature authoritarian and technocratic. Uh, and by the way, Information technology is all, has made all this possible, right? I mean, information technology is the nervous system through which all this flows. Without computers and modern digital technologies and communications, this economy would be absolutely impossible to have built. It's a 24-7 command structure functioning in real time. Money markets themselves to $5 trillion a day. Algorithms are trading in one millionth of a second, faster than any 
human can possibly. 70% of trades, by the way, worldwide now are done by algorithms that are programmed by a handful of people, five teams of five, six, seven people, and then they're in the hard drive and they're running a large part of the world economy. Uh, they're just programmed to look for all sorts of trades. It's all math and reading words and it's, you know, it's at speeds that are impossible for humans. Um, when I talk about the money markets of five trillion dollars a day, uh, one example I like to use, and I've in fact may have used it two years ago or five years ago when I spoke here. Uh, you know, one million is, uh, is a figure we can get our brains around because one million seconds is 12 and a half days. One trillion seconds is 36,000 years. And so uh, when we say that the money markets are trading five trillion dollars a day, Sort of get wrap your mind around that. When I say BlackRock manages five trillion dollars, get your mind around that. You know that's that's how large numbers that we're talking about under the control of the transnational capitalist class. That gives them their wealth. That gives them their power, right? Their governmental power. Their political clout. So running this type of system, as I said, is of course authoritarian and technocratic. Uh, and we can see that in how the EU has acted, particularly in terms of Greece, which is the most blatant and horrific example of their authoritarian rule. We can see it in trade deals like the Trans-Pacific uh, trade deal that we're trying to stop going through Congress at this point. Uh, we see it in the IMF. We see it in the international trade courts. None of this has to do with democracy. It has to do with eliminating democracy and eliminating any democratic input from folks like ourselves, right? That you just put it up here where you and I can't touch it, where we have no say, and that's where we're going around the world from. Uh, Politically, we talk about neoliberalism a lot. Neoliberalism is not a governmental policy. It's the ideology of the transnational capitalist class. That's why it has so much lasting power. You know, I think I was surprised, and many of us were surprised, and people like Krugman and Stiglitz were also surprised, that after the crash of 2008, neoliberalism didn't come crashing down with it. How in the hell did it survive the debacle, this incredible crisis that it created in 2008? It's because it's not just policy, it's ideology. It's a view of how the world works, that markets are superior, that markets should run the world, that markets are efficient, that austerity somehow leads to a better economy in the long run. You know, it's deeply ingrained in the transnational class it's an ideology, not a democratic or republican or social democratic policy that comes in and out of government. You know, it's the ideology of the class. So austerity, privatization, tearing up social contracts, cyber spying as exposed by Snowden and others. Uh, this is the direction that the transnational capitalist class has taken us in and this is why there are so many people, I think, now concerned with the dying of democracy, the narrowing of democracy, uh, that we all feel it's slipping out of our hands. Even in the dialectically contradictory manner in which I described as historical development, which, right, even, but even that, even the victories that we have won within the old nation-state formation of the social relations that came out of the nation state that, uh, that meant that a national capitalist class was rooted to its national boundaries and its national working class, which meant that it had to concede things like voting rights and women's rights and labor rights and better wages and home ownership and public education and health care because it needed us. Well, with global capitalism, 
They're just walking away from that, running away from that, tearing it up, kicking us in the ass, essentially, and saying goodbye. So I think that's what's starting to create a global rebellion. So let me go on to my second part here, uh, which I sort of talk about the hegemic crisis, right, that transnational capitalist class and neoliberalism has been the hegemic ruling block since Thatcher and Reagan, since about 1980, right? So that's about, what, 35 or 36 years as the dominant hegemic block. And that block is starting to break up. That block is being fundamentally challenged from all sorts of directions. And it's being challenged because of economic instability, the social crisis, causing a lack of legitimacy, a disbelief in government, and of course the environmental crisis as an aspect of that. Now, where will we go in the future? I think there's a number of different ways we can go. So we can have a reconstituted, more authoritarian globalist regime. Maybe they'll get their act together. They'll be able to get out of the stagnation a little bit. They'll be able to reconstitute what they've been doing with a little more force, with a little more authoritarianism, thus democracy, but stagnation will continue. I don't think that will happen, but it's a possibility. There's also globalist regime of what they call inclusive capitalism. And this is Lawrence Summers, and this is the head of the IMF, and the head of the UK banking system, and many other top players in capitalist elite circles are talking about, well, you know, we've gone a little too far, and austerity is creating too much social disruption. We have to back off from this stuff, and capitalism needs to be inclusive. So globalism is essential, trade is great, a borderless world is multicultural and wonderful, and we should continue in this direction, but we need to be a bit more sensitive to the masses of people. Uh, so that's, that's another wing of the capitalist class that is arguing and putting out their papers and meeting and and doing their thing. Um, and then we're faced with perhaps the greatest danger, not perhaps the greatest danger, absolutely the greatest danger in my estimation, reactionary nationalism, racism, xenophobia. And we see this in Trump, we see this in Europe, in the rise of the radical right in Europe, and Le Pen, and Austria, and the Netherlands, and all over. Uh, and we see it in part in the British exit vote, which I want to talk about here in a little bit. Uh, and then we have the possibilities of, of also green capitalism. And I actually think that green capitalism offers their best alternative. Uh, and I think that green capitalism has made major inroads um, over the last number of years that Global warming is now accepted by the vast majority of the capitalist class itself, except for the Republican Party in America, essentially. Uh, and we can see people like Robert Rubin, who was the Secretary of Treasury under Bill Clinton, who fought against the Kyoto uh, Global Warming Treaty, Goldman Sachs alumni, executive board of Citibank coming out and saying, uh, you know, uh, the environmental crisis is going to undermine the, uh, the, the economy, and to save the economy, we have to save the environment. That's a total change around for Rubin. We have other people like Hank Paulson, Secretary Treasurer under George W. Bush, right? Another CEO of Goldman Sachs very big on green capitalism. Bloomberg, billionaire independent from New York, right? Many others. Um, 
uh, Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, Jack Ma from Alibaba in China. Uh, they're all pushing green capitalism, greater research and development. Now, green capitalism is essentially solves three major issues for the capitalist class. Number one, it would set off a new round of what they call creative destruction and a new cycle of accumulation. So creative destruction, destroy the old fossil fuel economy, free up that capital, put it into green technology. So solar, wind, new transportation, new architecture, new agriculture, new productive recycling, all sorts of things. And all those new technologies and all those corporations that get a lead on those new technologies are the winners in the future and they'll be making the profits in the future. Those are, those are so a, a capitalist expansion, but a capitalist expansion that actually lowers resource, use of resources and fossil fuels, etc. Number two, renewed legitimacy. So if they can pull off a green capitalism, they also enhance their political legitimacy, which has been thoroughly now exposed over neoliberalism, right? So they have to, how do they renew their people's belief in their class rule? Green capitalism is an excellent way to do it. Save the planet. And what Gramsci called a passive revolution. You incorporate uh, leaders of the social movements into your new hegemic block. So you incorporate people like Bill McKibben from 350.org. You incorporate other environmental leaders, Sierra Club or whoever, right? Number three, defense stability. So if you have been reading um, material from the defense, uh, uh, the defense institutions, you know, the strategic think tanks of the Pentagon and the Army and the Navy and the Air Force. If you've been reading documents coming out of the CIA, if you've been reading documents coming out of the whole defense community, they have for the, at least the past decade, if not more, been talking about uh, global warming uh, as a security issue and the lack of water as a security issue. And they're very concerned about, well, the economic and social crisis that comes from an environmental crisis. So they have been advocating for green capitalism themselves out of the defense community. Uh, and uh, if you think the refugee crisis is bad now, right, wait until Bangladesh starts to go underwater. Uh, as well as many other parts of the world. That sets off millions of environmental refugees. Hell, not only from Bangladesh, wait till half of Texas moves into Chicago to be next to the Great Lakes. You know, as the Southwest starts to burn up. I can look at California. Uh, so uh, so the, the defense community is also actually pro-green. Uh, now, the thing about green capitalism is that it is not particularly anti-neoliberal. That's one of the things that we have to realize. Rubin, Bloomberg, Paulson, these guys were the architects of neoliberalism. And nothing in their conception of green capitalism is anti-austerity, anti-privatization, or anti-sweatshop. In fact, if you look at the largest U.S headquartered solar panel corporations. Most of their production was already in Malaysia and the Philippines. Uh, solar World, the largest U.S. solar panel corporation, is owned by the Walton family of Walmart. That's who, that who, that's who owns the largest solar panel producer in the U.S. 80% of their panels, where they produce? In Malaysia, right? So what is the agenda of the environmental movement, the progressive movement, and the left if green capitalism starts to put together a new hegemonic block to displace 
financial speculation. Well, what our agenda needs to be is to tie social justice to environmental justice. That humans are part of the environment, we're not obviously separated from it, and we have to fight for good wages, unionization, uh, all sorts of social issues around within green capitalism. So, is it going to be green capitalism or is it going to be a green new deal via Roosevelt's new deal of the 1930s? I think that's one of the tactical and strategic questions the left faces as green capitalism gathers strength and starts to perhaps offer an alternative hegemic block to what we've been seeing. Alternative hegemic block to reactionary nationalism and alternative hegemic block to financial specul speculative globalization. So I would say that yeah, we should participate and be part of that movement, but with our own agenda, going in with our agenda and just not following the lead of the green capitalists themselves. I think one other important issue here to think about uh, is uh, the decentralization of solar power. And so this will be my last example on green capitalism, and I'll go into the final part of my talk. Um, what a lot of the solar panel corporations want, and the Walmart family, and by the way, uh, Buffett has been part of this, is to create a large centralized uh, uh, operations of solar production, in other words, large solar farms, right, covering thousands of acres, which by the way will probably only employ once they're built about 50 or 65 people to maintain them. I mean, employment in this area is almost zero after they're built. Now, it's interesting that both in Arizona, the Waltons, where the Waltons were active, and in Nevada where Warren Buffett happens to own the, the Nevada Energy Company, uh, that a decentralized solar panel uh, strategy has been fought against. So decentralized solar panel strategy, put it on everybody's roofs. Put it on homeowners, put it on schools, put it on public buildings, decentralize and make an independent energy grid, right? As actually was sort of followed in Germany and Japan. Uh, in Nevada, Nevada has the largest employment in the United States in terms of the solar power industry. Buffett totally undermined it. They went to court, they challenged uh, uh, all the decentralization of homeowners having panels on their rooftops. They said they weren't paying, paying their fair share of the energy network and uh, got uh, subsidies knocked off uh, and up the uh, price uh, of building and installing your own solar panel units and the whole solar panel industry essentially crashed in Nevada in terms of independent businesses and farms and families putting up solar panels on their homes. Uh, so Buffett could provide energy from his utility company. Waltons are doing the same thing in Arizona. So. That's something I don't think much of the left has caught on to as of yet. I think that's an important battle in terms of now and the future. A decentralized energy so we don't allow the green economy to be re-monopolized right, by the same neoliberal guys that we've already been fighting. So let me uh, go into the last part here. I won't take too long on it. But uh, I want to talk about reactionary nationalism a little bit. Uh, obviously, Trump is a wonderful example here, and uh, thank God for Bernie Sanders, uh, because without Sanders, we would have no example of an alternative to reactionary nationalism, no alternative to an anti-globalist, anti-Wall Street, anti-1% uh, explanation of the crisis. Trump would have been the only person out there with that explanation. So thank God for Bernie's uh, campaign offering an alternative which attracted, we know, a lot of young people, but also a lot of working class people was a large part of his base of his vote too. Now, let's look at um, 
the uh, British exit. Uh, and I sort of have been surprised by not all, but the majority of left articles that I've read about the Brit exit um, really extolling it uh, as a great thing, uh, really from almost an uncritical standpoint. Uh, I think the UK exit has two aspects to it. Uh, one aspect is an anti-transnational, globalist uh, revolt against austerity, against this type of authoritarian, technocratic rule that the EU symbolizes, well, not only symbolizes, but puts into practice. The other aspect is anti-immigration and racism. And these two aspects have always been the fundamental basis of fascism. Fascism, this isn't about authoritarianism and racism. Fascism has always had a populist, anti-elite uh, rhetoric. Look at Hitler, look at Mussolini, look at Trump, look at the main proponents of the British exit and their campaign uh, uh, throughout the UK recently. So, um, who is responsible for austerity, uh, the undermining of the health care system and the public transportation system and the ending of the mining industry in the UK? Well, did it start in the EU or did it start with London and Thatcher? Where did, where did it really come from? So where is your anger going to be really directed towards? Your own ruling class? or the EU. Now the EU is partly responsible, but there was nothing in the rhetoric of people like Boris Johnson about Thatcher and the history of austerity and, and, and same with Trump. You know, I, was, I just read a uh, article by Marie Le Pen from France, right? And uh, she was extolling the vote in Great Britain and how France should now leave the EU too. And there were lots of wonderful words about freedom and sovereignty and democracy and independence. There was not one word about austerity, privatization, or capitalism. That's what reactionary, that's, that's the hook of reactionary nationalism that wins over the working class. And then they feed it with racism and xenophobia, right? So we have to be careful about when we think about this vote in Great Britain and understand both aspects of what, what created it. Also, I have to say that people in France and the UK talking about sovereignty and independence without talking about colonialism is sort of incredibly hypocritical. I mean, these are the greatest, some of the greatest colonial imperialist powers in the history of the world, and now they're complaining about a loss of sovereignty? Well, what the hell did you do for the last 200 years in the third world? What did you do to Africa? What did you do to Asia? And now that you're complaining about immigration, where in the hell do those people come from? But your cologne, your colonies. That's who's, that's who's coming from Pakistan and India and Angola. How, how in the hell do you think this immigration started? But through your own colonialism and your own um, uh, violation of sovereignty of other people. And reactionary nationalism totally refuses to recognize and link right, those two issues. The loss of sovereignty today to technocratic globalization and your own colonial past and your own responsibility to it. Um, you know what it reminds me a little bit of here in the United States, and I know in this audience we're all old enough to remember this if you were back in the 70s, the busing. Remember busing when they started to bus black children into white schools and white kids into black schools? Remember the anti-busing movement and how it broke out in Boston? And I was in Louisville at the time where the anti-busing movement was big and partly led by the Klan. Well, I remember in Boston, which was one of the really flare-up points of the anti-busing movement, uh, and how essentially racist it was. And yet, one of the 
main um, communist organizations of that period, the Revolutionary Union, uh, extolled the anti-busing movement in Boston. Said it was a working class revolt against the government because, yeah, we're all for neighborhood schools, right? I mean, of course neighborhood schools are better. Of course you don't want to bust your kids across town. And this is the essence of the revolt by the white working class in Boston. We're going to join those demonstrations, the anti-busing demonstrations, right? This is sort of the white blind spot of the white left, uh, not only in America, but other countries too. And in fact, it was part of the Sanders campaign until Black Lives Matter had to kick Bernie in the ass uh, to get him to uh, start to recognize the question of racism as well as class, right? Race and class, not just class. Uh, and if you only talk about class, if we only talk about class, we're going to uh, not be able to fight reactionary nationalism. We're going to be out Trump by Trump. That's who's going to win it. Uh, so uh, we have to take a firm stand around xenophobia, a firm stand around racism uh, to win this battle. And that's what worries me about some of these articles I've been reading by smart people from the left talking about the British exit. It's not, not, not everybody, but I've been surprised by the amount of articles, like I said, talking about, oh man, this exit is great, the working class is rebelling against the globals and transnational, yeah. But hey, put it into perspective, what's, what's the steam and the power behind this movement? So uh, let me uh, end there, because I've been going for about the time I said I would go, and uh, open it up for some debate, and questions, and discussions. Thank you. Oh, great talk, Jerry. Um, just a couple of notes here. Um, for those of you that are interested, or if you have friends, obviously there's like 25 odd people here. Uh, this program will be up online on our YouTube channel within the next probably 24 hours. So the uh, shortcut to that would be just um, uh, open UNIV of the left, not spelling out university, just U-N-I-V of the left, hyphen YouTube. That's the quick way to find it. So if you got any friends you want to let them know about uh, that, you might want to take a note of that. Anyway, uh, uh, I just have one thing um, where I was a little bit fuzzy on. I thought that, um, you know, with, when you were speaking with regards to transnationalism, I didn't hear too much about because uh, one of the things that we are hearing about today is this notion about financialization, which is to say that, you know, uh, the historical um, formation, i.e. capital manufacturing, has really taken kind of a back seat now to this. And is that really what you, I mean, are you just using other terminology to describe the same? I mean, I'm a little bit unclear about that. I just wanted to leave that with you, so maybe you want to enlighten us. Yeah, in my book, I do use the term financialization, and uh, that's what I was trying to describe when I talked about BlackRock and uh, the, these large uh, financial corporations bringing in capital from all over the world and organizing it and putting it back out uh, into the world. That is financialization. Now, we can't overlook production, but I think financial, in, you know, finance sort of has taken over production in terms of their investments and control of it. So, I mean, the global assembly lines are as much part of the world today as they have ever been. Working class hasn't disappeared, it's just sort of moved to the south. You know. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm curious where you stand on this issue. I mean, the, the combination of capitalism with the national state brought along with the military and the coercive power hung around with the state. And as these institutions transcend the state, where is the military going to wind up in this constellation? Who's going to be directing the coercive power, and where, is our, where are the notes of power going to be? Yeah, yeah the military, and I've written on the military uh, on a number of occasions, and, but 
I only have a small section of this book on it, uh, which has already been criticized by one of my friends. But uh, uh, I think the military is a really interesting question because the military maintains more than any other capitalist institution a culture of uh, national side ideologies and patriotism, right? Uh, and they're, uh, they're, what, what they exist for is to defend the nation. So that, that sort of patriotism and that type of ideology is very strong. I did spend a lot of time uh, during the Iraq War uh, going in and reading uh, strategic studies in all the major military think tanks. Uh, and there's a lot of them. I mean, their, their intellectual community is very large and very well developed. And they really uh, have a, a number of different uh, schools of thought. And one of those schools of thought is very globalist in terms of the role of what the military should be doing uh, and what it represents. Others are still more nationalistic and define, for example, China is going to be our next superpower enemy. Uh, or Russia will be, you know, it's re-emerging as our enemy and we have to surround it and limit it. So, um, I think globalization, as all histor historical developments, are uneven. Uh, and it proceeds unevenly. So I think transnationalism, while it has advanced very deeply into economic, uh, into sort of business and finance, has not uh, gone as deeply into the military. Uh, and so we see uh, aspects of nationalism still exist, obviously, in the world today. I mean, that's, I think, actually perhaps the greatest dynamic in the world today is the transnational national dialectic, and that both are fighting to, one is to retain this old world, the other is trying to build this new world, and that breaks out in all sorts of ways. I try to cover that in my book on the Ukraine, which I think is a really interesting example of both national influence within the Ukraine as well as global capitalist interests between Europe and Russia and the United States. So perhaps the people in the nation states are going to be paying for the military and the transnational class will get out of that business and keep the profits. Yeah. Uh, I always thought that the World War I and World War II uh, were fought between the finance and uh, manufacturing capital. I think that's true. But your exposition now brings in the transnationalism, which didn't exist in those periods. Also, I was thinking that uh, it would be inimical to the interests of transnational capitalists uh, to endorse the so-called peace movement between police and the community. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the transnational capitalist class itself is uh, split into various political factions. And uh, in fact, uh, one of my first articles, which I wrote with William Robinson back in the year 2000, uh, went into uh, sort of three, three political sectors within the transnational capitalist class. Uh, so I think today, certainly, we have a neo-Kensian uh, wing of the transnational capitalist class. Uh, and they would view, they certainly view multiculturalism, crossing borders of, for executives and managers and labor. They need uh, uh, social stability for that. They need cultural acceptance to build this cross-border world. Uh, and so they would view uh, racial tensions as something detrimental uh, to the world they're trying to build. I think others, uh, in the transnational capitalists, I still don't give a damn. As long as they're making money, to hell with these people. They're racist to the core. Yeah, thanks for your thorough analysis. Um, and uh, the first one, since Joe has had the hopes that transnationalism will improve the peace and uh, solidarity among the nations, uh, what happened? What happened with transnationalism was uh, the disintegration of the state structure, which brought uh, lately such a rise in sects and tribal and uh, 
clans, violence, and, and so it's, a, it's just a different kind of uh, brutalism. <laughs> um, I really, really enjoyed your analysis about Brexit uh, and the point of uh, plugging Thatcher here uh, as, as the originator of uh, uh, fascism and re reactionary um, movement. Um, and <coughs> I'm glad that you pointed out that class and, ra and race are separate factors and intertwined, although separate. Uh, and speaking about race and an age generation, observing this group for a long time, for years now, <coughs> um, we tend to be white and old, um, very white and very old. I don't see here, um, I don't see here one person of color. Um, I don't know, you must be the youngest here. Uh, and uh, one of the, the, the thoughts, Bob, is I wonder if we could have some meetings at the library, public library down south. Because the location here has a lot to do with what we see. Um, okay, back to you. Um, um, I have a question about some of, of, of your statements. Uh, isn't green capitalism an oxymoron? I mean, when the very principles of capitalism, which is the profit, um, how far can they go in preventing a big company such as uh, BP from uh, um, ruining our, our oceans. Um, how far can we go with um, stopping all this plastic access uh, in ripping as, as a cheap way to package uh, and to sell? Um, I have very uh, much doubt so far what is happening with solar energy. There are subsidies and there are ways to, to go around it at, at this point, but they are not really capitalistic principles. Um, so um, I'm very, uh, I think capitalism will have to go as far as the planet needs. And we don't have time, it's so imminent. In 2050, uh, the oceans are supposed to have more plastic than fish. Um, that's, uh, most scientists agree, agree about that, so it's kind of scary. Um, that's one question, how do you see them really blending? Um, another one, I want to ask you uh, in the handout that you gave, it said uh, civil that democracy is about relationship between the state, markets, and civil society. What do you call civil society? Yeah, do you mean the people? Um, and um, you mentioned that class was a necessary uh, concept at the, uh, at the time of the bourgeois revolutionary against aristocracy, but is it really needed now for creating solidarity? I mean, uh, history changed and the structure changed. Um, so what, uh, those are my questions. Okay. Uh, well, first on uh, how far can capitalism go in terms of uh, economic sustainability. Uh, uh, to me, in part, it's an open question, uh, depending on uh, political alignments uh, and the power of uh, the environmental movement, the progressive movements, and how far it can be pushed. Uh, it certainly, I don't think, can solve strategically and fundamentally uh, the environmental movement. I think, uh, I don't think green capitalism is an oxymoron, but sustainable capitalism may be an oxymoron because it can uh, create a number of reforms. Some of those reforms may be rather significant, uh, 
depending again on the political balance of power. But the underlying logic is, as you point out. Uh, so, for example, one problem, and I think McKibben and 350.org has brought this out, is that for the oil companies, they claim trillions of dollars of resources that are still underground. And, uh, you know, if, if we don't want to go past four degrees centigrade, uh, two-thirds of that will have to be left underground. Now, Exxon has already said, no way in hell. <laughs> We're bringing it all up. Uh, and uh, that uh, those reserves are part of their, their capital uh, value in terms of the stock market. Governments, including progressive governments, unfortunately, like Venezuela and Ecuador, uh, part of their budgeting is counting on bringing up those reserves from underground, right? They're already, they're, the money is already budgeted out. Uh, so, yeah, there's some really serious roadblocks. Um, and it's not only in the growth cycle, I believe it's also in the recessionary cycle. There's one thing I did in the book, you know, uh, a lot of environmentalists, as, as you had talked about, well, capitalism always has to grow. More energy, more labor, more land, more resources. True. The other half of the cycle is recession. So what's happened to the solar and wind power energy in the 2008 recession? Crash. Subsidies were withdrawn. One of the great um, uh, ironies, I thought, of the 2008 crash was um, China's wind and solar uh, uh, efforts. China went from almost a non-player to, in five years, being the number one producer of solar panels and wind turbines in the world. Shows you what government planning can still do. Uh, the uh, production of solar panels, therefore, brought down the price of solar power to where it was actually competitive with coal and oil. But bringing down the price of solar panels meant a crisis of profitability for solar corporations. The price came down, their profits came down. Uh, in addition, the Chinese were able to produce, along with world production, 65 megawatts of solar power, I think it was in 2010 or 2011. The worldwide demand was only for 30 megawatts. So there was more than a 100% what capitalism would call overproduction of solar power uh, panels, right? What does overproduction do in a capitalist society? Creates bankruptcy, right? And that's exactly what happened to the solar industry. Uh, now, from a progressive point of view, subsidizing uh, solar panel and wind turbine pr pr uh, production as the Chinese did, more production, lower prices, uh, is exactly what we want. <laughs> and yet under capitalism, it created the exact opposite. It created a crisis, you know. And that goes to, so it's just not only the growth cycle, can capitalism also solve this recessionary cycle? Uh, very briefly on civil society, it's all the institutions that are not under government, right? So, uh, NGOs, social movement, church, uh, pu well, public education as government. Uh, but so all, all, all the places where we exist outside of government institutions, where we come together collectively as a society. Thank you, Jay. That was an excellent presentation. And uh, uh, living at 85th in California, I'm in favor of moving the thing down there. <laughs> we have public libraries down there too. Um, actually, my, I have a number of questions. I think you raised a lot of interesting points. I'm, I'm gonna, uh, the, I was thinking uh, about also about the green question and a very similar question to what was already asked, but in a different context. You were talking about their different sections of the transnational uh, you know, capitalist class. And one of the things that um, I've been talking about with some other people and trying to get a handle on is the split in the class between 
the production of green technology and oil. And you just referred to it in some degree, but uh, there are a number of aspects to it. I mean, for one thing, what was, I didn't catch the number you said. I heard $74 trillion worth of oil in the ground. Is that what, about what you said? Yeah, I didn't put a price on it. Oh, okay. So something like seventy-four trillion dollars of oil uh, assets that they're—they aren't going to give that up without a fight. And uh, besides uh, the questions of uh, some of the progressive regimes, we have questions like uh, Nigeria, which is the biggest uh, economy in Africa, and that civil society is practically coming apart now to replace oil, which is its primary income, uh, you know, would, would send it into utter chaos. And uh, we have the Middle East. Uh, we, I know Saudi Arabia, they have a prince that's now talking about green technology. Um, however, the economic reality of Saudi Arabia is oil. Uh, so my question is really, you know, there's this potential split within the ruling class. I also, oh, the other thing I wanted to bring in was the level of technology in solar panels. Uh, it is ready to take off. It, they uh, are actually developing, uh, I gather it's a paint-on kind of uh, panel that you could put on every window that's clear. And if they painted that on every window uh, in the world, that would solve the energy problem. Uh, and there, there are some projections that solar energy and some of this kind of technology will meet 100% of the world's t uh, energy needs by, say, 2030, something yeah. along those lines. Um, so this split, I mean, that's, that's, there's real money there. There's real money in, uh, in the uh, oil industry and the fossil fuel industry. How do you see this as a split within the ruling class uh, might play out and what's, what's developing? Um, well, I, th I think that the green capitalism, uh, as I was approaching it in my talk, uh, may have the capacity to put together a new hegemic block, right? And hegemic blocks are not only uh, from the top, they're also from the bottom. Right, so you have to incorporate into a hegemonic block, as Gramsci talked about, uh, uh, consent of the popular masses, people. So I think green capitalism has a great capacity to do that, just as financial neoliberalism loses the capacity of having a social base. Their, their social base was based on, you'll get, you'll get richer. You know, speculate on housing, put money in the stock market, every individual can get rich, join the party. That's blown up in their face. So um, uh, I think there's this great, and, and as the technology and the corporations uh, get more grounded and find a greater market, their markets will expand, they'll get more political clout, and it will start to become more of a political battle. Um, the, um, uh, I think one of the battles may be uh, the 74 trillion left in the ground. Well, if it's left in the ground, our demand should be, you're not going to be compensated for that. What will, their, what will Exxon say? Compensate us for leaving our 20 trillion in the ground. You pay taxes, we're going to take the money from the government, the government's going to have to compensate us. That means all of us will have to compensate them for leaving their dirty and so I, I think that may be a big future battle. Things, things like that. Those would be some of the dividing lines. Um, you know, you mentioned Nigeria. Uh, uh, look at Venezuela with the loss of oil revenues and, and the socialist project in Venezuela. What does it mean for the uh, socialist projects in Bolivia and Ecuador? Or, uh, and look what the corruption has led to the crisis in Brazil and the Workers' Party there, too. So, um, uh, there's, as you said, I think it's a complex picture with splits, and I think it's really important for the left to start to think about uh, how a new hegemonic block might be put together, and what are the different possibilities, and where, what, what is our role, and where are we going to end up? You know, because I think the other great uh, threat, of, as I said, is from reactionary nationalism, that that can become a new hegemonic block. Uh, and that's, I think, pretty scary. 
Uh, uh, so. Okay, hi, I'm Mara Cohen from the National Trade Justice Alliance. I thank you so much for your, your really insightful talk. Um, I think what's happening now to the, the transnational capitalist class is it's beginning to be less of a class and more of a corporatocracy run by corporate um, members. The Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Trade and Services Agreement, and TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, have all been thrown into the lap of Congress by the, tr the Fast Track um, Trade Promotion Authority, which has given um, the President the ability to bring trade agreements to them for yes or no votes for the next six years. These are very threatening because they set up a corporate court that has the, the corporations are 600 people and the corporate court will uh, cycle through them so that if a corporation feels that it's losing uh, uh, profits and continuing to lose them on into the future, they can, set, they can sue any government, whether it's a state, a nation, a township, for any rules and regulations or laws that they pass that this corporation says they're going to lose money from. And it's a binding co uh, resolution, um, agreement, um, verdict, I mean. People, the government has to pay up from taxpayers' dollars. Two examples of this are right now, the United States has passed a wonderful food um, uh, safety issue called the Cool Act. I, Many of you may know the country of origin labeling for meat. And Canada and Mexico sued the United States for having this law so that we had to reverse it. So now you don't know where your meat's coming from. <laughs> there is no country of origin labeling. Um, I think the corporatocracy now has understood that it doesn't need the masses of people to purchase things. They can't. All they are is a waste of money on wealth, corporate welfare, and they don't want to give it anymore. So I think there's less of a concern about markets and, um, and producing goods that people will buy than about preserving the corporatocracy's environment just for themselves and promoting laws, that, uh, promoting trade policies that will serve them exclusively Another example, since we're talking about environment here, is that in India, the government decided that it was going to have close to 100% um, solar energy production, that it was going to be delocalized, and that it was all going to be made in India. Well, the United States, which says that India and China are the worst polluters in the world, came and said, this was actually through, through the uh, investor state uh, dispute settlement. Um, that Canada couldn't do, I mean, India couldn't do that because they wanted to hire all local uh, production from India. So they had to abandon the solar <laughs> project or pay, you know, billions of dollars in, uh, in, in, the, in suit settlements. So those are just a couple of things. So I think that we're entering a truly post, uh, Exclude, uh, strictly Marxist capitalist class because it isn't a class anymore. It's too small for that. <laughs> it's a well, I would say the transnational is, is still a class and um, it's not too small. I mean, there's some people like Rothkopf who wrote a very interesting book on the elites. He was uh, worked with Kissinger for a long time. So there's about 6,000 people in military politics and economics that decides everything. 6,000, I would say, is too small for a class. But if you look at, and I have this data in the book, um, there's about uh, 150,000 people with uh, 30 million to $1 billion of investable income. You mean national? No, international. Still pretty small. Uh, still small, but enough. Um, now, in terms of the... Uh, Courts. I, in fact, I cover the trade agreements and the, and the courts in my book. Uh, I think another example uh, 
of the trade courts is that TransCanada is going to sue the U.S. on the cancellation of the Keystone. Uh, so we'll see what happens there. Um, and, uh, you know, I looked at the court cases uh, that have gone through the WTO, um, and uh, corporations don't always win. I mean, uh, corporations have won uh, about 40% um, uh, of the cases, and countries have won about 60% of the cases. Uh, some of the cases are rather interesting because uh, actually environmental corporations are suing the Czech Republic and some other company for withdrawing subsidies from, from the environmental industry. Uh, but yeah, overall they're incredibly authoritarian, non-democratic, and reactionary. Uh, in terms of, um, you know, uh, the working class, I just wanted to say that uh, you know, in finance, uh, I talked about algorithms and how powerful the algorithms were and uh, how few people actually write the algorithms. Uh, you know, therefore, the space between the working class and the capitalist class has never been greater than it is currently. So that the capitalist class, financial speculators, can make billions of dollars uh, based really on investments in algorithms. Now, that's a step away from productive capital. So if your daily reality is investing through algorithms and not running Ford or running GE, uh, your mentality, your daily reality is dealing with this computer where there's very little labor. So your conception of needing the working class is gone. You don't need the working class. You don't need them educated. Uh, cut my taxes, uh, austerity for them. Uh, uh, all the stuff we're seeing is part of this new consciousness, part of the class consciousness of the transnational capitalist class. Right? And so they exist as a self-conscious class. It is small, but I believe the numbers are there uh, enough numbers to uh, show that they exist. I think we're getting short on time, so there's a, we a have couple about more. We have 10 minutes. Uh, a few 10 more, minutes. Few more people. I was going to address the military question, I, but I, I won't. <laughs> okay. I had my turn. Undoubtedly, <laughs> there's lots of questions, but the three that occur to me, and how to make a brief. Um, well, the first one's easy to make brief, is how do you theorize race? Um, what the hell is that? Uh, I've heard it theorized as a caste, but that doesn't tell me much. It's just a different name. So that's one thing. Where does that fit in? What's the dynamic there in capital? Well, that's one question. Two. Um, that's a career. That's a career. I know. I know. <laughs> Two. Um, it has to do with this sort of uh, yin yang of of uh, what happens when you get like before World War One. The we had this notion of we're getting into this. Uh, Global capital, that was the, they didn't call it global, but that was basically what everybody was talking about. But uh, as um, margins got thinner, uh, profits got a little harder, the investments got um, harder to amortize internationally, i.e., all the weapons. And lo and behold, Europe went back to its old tradition of, of you know, cutting its own throat. And I just wonder how much longer we can avoid it on a world scale, whatever sets it off. And in other words, whatever would make transnationalism a lovely. For example, right now, I've been shocked at just how easily China has been allowed, if I may say, to come up and become, okay, let's say the world's number two power, all things considered. In, in no time at all, but without much pushback from the established powers. I, I, compared to the past, let's say. So I'm saying how long can things like that continue? And then finally, um, the, another question I have is this notion of democracy. First of all, I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, do you mean a republic with some sort of uh, parliamentary fringe? Or do you mean, what do you mean? Uh, it seems to me that 
summarizing that the more democratic you've had in uh, the dynamics of, of uh, expansion and contraction ever since the classic era, I'm going to go on a limb here, uh, democracy as such has been tied up with aggressive nation states uh, using democracy to uh, create a kind of nationalism, whatever you want to call it, and therefore give some of the people who are, in say Athens' case, the rowers of the boats became the Democrats, but what did they need? They needed war, they wouldn't get wealthy, and they got war. So you get the point, I think, that uh, in the U.S. it was the uh, expansion west, you know, the uh, good uh, colonial to good uh, loyal Brits said, let's put a line up at the Appalachians and we'll gradually, no, said the Democrats. We got to take that land and they took it. And so I'm going to claim that that's the tendency for democracy. So I'll leave those three. Okay. Uh, democracy is a historic process, so there's no one definition. Uh, obviously, through my introduction in my talk, uh, uh, democracy was part of the bourgeois revolution. And as we know, capitalism has always been violent, imperialistic, and racist. It's always been part, part of its identity. Uh, uh, you know, the question of the rise of China, I think this is a good example of transnational capitalism because uh, rather than nation-centric. So how did China rise so fast without, you know, being uh, confronted militarily, politically on the international stage? Well, it rose quickly because the trillions of dollars of investments uh, went into China uh, from the transnational capitalist class. Uh, its integration into globalization was essential for the rise of the transnational capitalist class and for the formation of globalism. Therefore, it wasn't confronted uh, in the old manner. Uh, on race, that's such a big question. Uh, there's a lot of interesting work on race being socially constructed, uh, creation of whiteness. Uh, you know, uh, there's that program, BBS, that looks at your DNA and you find out that everybody is everything. Um, uh, obviously, race, as well as gender, has been part of uh, uh, capitalist, uh, the capitalist market to create divisions, to create exploitations, to create exploitation, to create a form of rule uh, that goes on today. Um, it's not easily solved. I think, I know uh, from my own experiences in the 60s and early 70s, uh, because of the rise of the civil rights movement, that uh, to me the left was more integrated at that time. I was certainly in organizations that were multiracial. Uh, that has uh, been largely replaced by identity politics, right, which has caused the great separation. Uh, but I can say that I was to the, at the People's Summit about two or three weeks ago here in Chicago, largely put on by the Nurses uh, Association, but many other people. Uh, 3,000 people talking about what to do after the Sanders campaign, how to continue it, how to create a new progressive movement. It was one of, or perhaps the most integrated age, gender, race, uh, large meeting I've been to like that. In, in a long time, uh, and uh, I hope that continues. Um, it's hard to break the barrier. Uh, I know in the Global so uh, Studies Association, when I organize a conference every year, uh, and not only in academia, but in every area, people have their areas now. So you have black studies and Latino studies and women's studies and global studies, uh, and people tend to keep to their areas. It's difficult to bring people together. This year we met uh, in Austin at the University of Texas and I developed the theme of, uh, of uh, crossing borders, uh, capital, people, and culture. And through that type of theme, we got a lot of Latino participation, as well as outreach to every Chicano Latino studies program I could find on the internet, you know, and sending emails to every teacher in those programs. Uh, and I think that, that that's the type of effort we need. Uh, and maybe maybe we can start to uh, create a multiracial movement 
but again, for white activists, I think it only can be established on the recognition of racial oppression. You can't establish class unity in America without taking a firm stand on racial oppression, or else black and Latino people, Asian people, will see nothing to unite with. This will be the last question and or comment. Hello. Uh, thank you very much. I have an opinion and a question. An opinion is that uh, we, the human race, is a virus that contaminating the earth is destroying the sustainable, uh, the, the things that sustain life on the earth. It's very obvious. I don't think anybody can deny it. And the question is that <clears throat> I just read that China is in the process of building a thousand nuclear plants to produce uh, energy. Um, when you talk about a thousand nuclear power plants, the time to build them, the energy that it takes and all that, and the consequences of all that uh, are, are, are beyond, beyond what I can explain in a few seconds, but I wonder what you think about it. Yeah. Well, is it the human race or is it capitalism that's the virus? The human race. We are <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> we are killing Tell each other. Yeah. Couples burn each other. In, in the Arab countries, in Argentina, they just throw liquid and burn the girl. Yeah. You know, because we have men with them. He's well, a human being. Yeah. We are we are fucked up. Well, human. <laughs> is it in your our DNA, or yes, is it in the is, is, is it in the so society that and the historic period that we're living in? It may not get out. of I mean, I agree. We may destroy ourselves. Well, it's very it very possible. Or or we may get past it. Uh, you know, I think, I think a lot of it's socially constructed. Uh, certainly we have uh, an aspect to our being that's violent. I mean, that, that is part of our human being. Can we evolve past that violence? Uh, or does that violence come out of uh, uh, scarcity? You know, the historic evolutionary <coughs> process of scarcity and having to fight for existence. Uh, if we get past scarcity, perhaps, you know, Marx said that human history wouldn't start until communism. Everything before communism was prehistory. Uh, and that may be, uh, I think, a uh, very insightful statement. Or perhaps. Uh, so uh, I don't think we can answer this question. Uh, we just have to live it. And uh, unfortunately for you and I, we won't see the end. Of it. We won't see the answer. Or unfortunately. In my lifetime, I see the process of the elimination of these species of life yeah. that I saw being disappearing in my lifetime. Yeah. And many that I don't even know. Yeah, one of the greatest environmental problems is the species extinction. Absolutely. Uh, it's happening very rapidly. What about China's uh, project? Oh, the nukes? Well, yeah, that's a problem. Where are you going to put all the radiation, all the rods? But uh, the other side of the argument is cold or nukes. You know, Hansen from the uh, NASA, one of the leading environmentalists in the world, has uh, come out in support of uh, new nuclear technology as a necessary evil in the face of uh, coal. Um, China has been shutting down a lot of its coal mines, but they're still opening up new coal mines. Uh, again, inside China, there's a struggle. Uh, the, you know, the coal industry is struggling. The, those who control and profit from the coal industry are struggling to open more mines. Uh, the environmentalists in China and the solar industry are struggling uh, from the opposite end, just like here. It's not just one uh, chairman who says, this is the way. The, you know, the struggle in China is very complex. Uh, and I imagine nukes are part of that mix. I, and I don't think they're just building them in China. I think China will probably be building them uh, in the global south also. They're going to export that technology. That's going to be, have to be the final comment. Thank you.